you're uh, an expert in, 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 the, in the sorghum crop and, the, and developing the, uh, the d different strains that are more drought resistant, resistant to, to uh, pests and parasites. Um, can you, can you talk? Can you talk about why about what, why you chose that specific crop? Obviously, it's a very important crop to uh, various parts of Africa and uh, other parts of the world. Sure. Uh, maybe as a background, I'm I'm a native of Ethiopia and grew up in uh, in uh, West Central Ethiopia. Uh, even though uh, sorghum was not an important crop from in my region where I grew up, uh, it was an important crop in the country. Um, but I grew up in a small farming community uh, where most everybody around me was subsistence farmers. Um, so uh, the life and work of uh, poor peasant farmers is something that I grew up with. So when I got to college, uh, my first job was in a crop improvement program, and the crop that I was assigned to actually was sorghum. So I was really assigned to the crop uh, to start with. And so my interest in the crop and in, in agriculture developed later on. You had uh, gotten in touch with a uh, was it with a, a researcher with with Purdue that you ended up working with that uh, that brought you over as a graduate student. It was all uh, chance happening, uh, accidental really. Um, 1973, uh, right after I graduated from college, a uh, professor at Purdue University by the name John Axtell had just made a major discovery in the science that he was doing and he did it on sorghum. And the sorghum that he discovered as having a particular uh, trait, a uh, trait of high protein, high protein quality, happened to be uh, a sorghum variant from Ethiopia. So he decided to come and visit the country and collect more sorghums to expand his research program. So he wrote to a professor at Alamea University who happened to be my boss uh, about uh, working with him in this collection trip. And so when John Axtell came to, to Ethiopia, uh, my, my professor there asked me to accompany them um, on a collection trip. And so Axtell and this fellow, Brahane, and I uh, traveled together for about a week in Ethiopia. And uh, during that time, he, he thought I was someone that he needed to encourage to get a graduate education. So he talked to my boss about coming to Purdue University and study under him. And uh, this was in November 1973, and by August, all my paperwork and everything about admission was done, and, and I was ready to come to Purdue University. So you uh, got, ended up getting two graduate degrees, uh, your PhD and your master's degree That's from right. Purdue. That's right. And, uh, uh, and you talk, talk about the, your, your research during that time and, and where it ended up taking you after that. Sure. Um, uh, I stayed at Purdue four years, four and a half years, got my Ph.D. And then at that time, I was not able to return to Ethiopia because of the, the civil war that was going on. And so um, I looked for uh, an employment opportunity in an international program uh, somewhere else. And I joined a program called ECRASAT working on sorghum and mullets, um, and the headquarters of the program was in India, and they had an opening, and I joined them, and they eventually got assigned in another African country, in, in the Sudan. And so I was in the Sudan for five years, and uh, that was where I developed the first commercial sorghum hybrid for Africa. Uh, five years later, um, children education were getting to be an issue, and I was looking to transfer somewhere else. And then Purdue had a, an opening, and they asked me to apply. And uh, I applied to be on the faculty in 1984. I came back and joined the faculty at Purdue University. And so once I got here, I continued the work that I had started in Africa, and now expanded it into this parasitic weed called Striga. Uh, so I started the Striga research at Purdue, and, and the discoveries made there were what was being recognized by the World Food Fund. In, and Striga is still, uh, uh, is still a very big problem, obviously. The, uh, the UN uh, estimates it affects uh, 100, million 100 million excuse me, people a year uh, in Africa. Um, is, but but the, the strides, I mean, that that one specific discovery made, um, I'm sure, is, has, has helped feed millions of people and improve the lives of millions of people. I guess uh, it's kind of a stupid question, but I mean, how, does that, how does that make you, f 
feel as a, as a researcher to have something that, that's so, that's just impacting so many people's lives and, and helped people all over the world. Yeah, it's, uh, it truly is, uh, no, no other way of saying it, it's, it truly is a humbling experience uh, to be told that the work that you have done has fed millions and saved lives and it's, it's just very humbling. Uh, very gratifying. Um, you know, you never knew that your work would lead to that. Um, but I think if, if there was one element of my character that, that led to uh, this kind of work is, is this thing that this culture that I talked about that we picked up both at, uh, at the high school in Atta al -Aman. This is this element of service um, that education is not an end by itself. Research and research publications don't end the story and that you really have to connect uh, to bring science to solve problems of people uh, and serve humanity. And that's really uh, something that was inculcated in me and the so-called land-grant university model um, that Oklahoma State University introduced in, in Ethiopia. And, uh, and I really attribute a great extent of the character that shaped my professional and my career to to that mindset. Well, it's been it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you. And uh, we're glad you're here in Stillwater, and I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you very so. much.